right. So Psalm 40, verse 1 says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. May, uh, many will see it and will f and fear and will trust in the Lord. And so David has been brought out of something horrible. Um, just, he describes it as a pit, as something that he couldn't get out of himself, a miry clay. That's not like just stepping off into the mud. That's something, when you step into something like that, you're stuck. I mean, it like sucks you down. You're, you're in there. And uh, they've got, you, you need help to get out of something like that. Uh, so um, David is acknowledging God's um, working in his life to pull him out of the situation that he had been in. David, you know, gives him praise and, and honors him for having heard his prayer, hurting his, hearing his cry and pulling him out of this situation and establishing his feet or his steps, you know, putting him back on the walk. That's the thing with God. When we ask, sometimes I think we just, we can't see beyond the situation. So we're just hoping to get out of the situation. Lord, get me out of this. Pull me out of this. I can't get out of this myself. And at the, at the moment, we don't really think about our walk then continuing after that. But it, it needs to, and, and we need to press on uh, in whatever God's called us to do. And David's saying, he established my steps. He set me basically back on a, on a walk again uh, with him. This whole psalm is very relational, very much relationship between him and God. He has put a new song in my mouth, praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. We, we saw one, one of the psalms we went through last week, David was saying, I'm weak and my enemies are seeing me as weak. You're going to have to protect me. You know, they're seeing the weakness that's in me and they're ready to attack. Here he's saying people are going to see this turnaround that God has caused in my life and they're going to fear God and trust in him because of it. You know, that, that God was powerful enough that God was active enough in David's life to turn him from whatever this is. This is a drastic turn in David's life from the bad to the good. Usually we say it's a drastic turn if we go from good to bad. But this is from from bad, a bad situation to a good situation. God has, it's just in David's eyes, it is absolutely evident that God and only God could have done this for him. And his assumption there is many will see it and fear God and will trust in the Lord. And that's that's our, our personal testimony. David doesn't even have to talk about what the situation is here. He assumes everybody already knows what the situation is. So we don't necessarily have to go out and recount every act, every action of our life. People who know us and knew us when when we were not walking with the Lord or when we were a prodigal and, and uh, you know, just being a, a, a spiritual brat, one of my friends used to put it. Um, <laughs> And the Lord turns us around, and it's evident for everybody who's around us. There's some kind of redirection of our life that is undeniable, and our answer should be similar to this. The Lord did it. God did it. This is not me. I couldn't have fixed this. I couldn't have, I couldn't have straightened this back out. I couldn't have made this successful or that happen. God has done this. That's the only explanation for it. And, and that is, you know, I think... All of us can, can use this concerning some aspect of our life, especially with people who have known us for a while. Uh, verse 4, Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are your wonderful works which you have done, and your thoughts toward us cannot uh, be recounted uh, to you in order if I would declare and speak of them they are more than can than can be numbered right, so blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust who trusts in the Lord and does not respect the proud so we're not we're not following after uh, 
prideful people, people who want to set themselves up, people who want to promote themselves, who, who want to sell, you know, you need to buy what I'm selling kind of thing, um, nor such as turn aside the lies, so not even those who would follow them. Uh, we, can, we can think of false teachers, that seriously false teachers that are up there, very arrogant, very proud, I mean, we'll just limit it to our own, our own Christian world and say there are many who are up there on the stages in whatever capacity, not all of them are pastors. You've got, you've got you know, musicians, you've got, you know, it's in the music end of it, it's in the, the preaching end, of it, all of it. And so somebody who doesn't respect that, you know, the pride of that person, nor turn aside to the lies. You don't follow the lies. If they're off, you know God well enough and you know his word well enough that if, that if somebody speaks something wrong, you can recognize it. And you don't just fall for it and follow it. And, you know, it's it's funny to me. I, I've not had anybody say to me that you use God. You know, I'm trying to think of how I'm. Like I pay too much attention or analyze things too much according to the Bible. Or I take things too literally. I haven't had me say that directly to me. I've heard of people saying it to other people or they've had it said to them. But it's been close. I've, I've irritated enough people with, well, that's not what the Bible says. <laughs> I think it's been close to, to, you know, you need to, you know, you can't have everything 100% Bible. And I can say, well, if it's concerning God, then yeah, it's got to be 100%. It's got to be. So we don't want to turn aside the lies. If you're going to be a blessed person, you've got to be somebody who's not easily turned away. Paul talked to Timothy about such people in, in First and Second Timothy that that those who are set in leadership wouldn't be doing that. That the warning in Second Timothy that many will will turn away. That they'll follow doctrines of demons. That you know they'll act like. Um, They'll act like uneducated women who just go wherever and do whatever and follow the drama rather than, than the reality of God. And uh, it's not exactly the wording he has, but it's just that that's the insinuation of it. And uh, you don't want to, there's no respect in that. There's none in that. It says, many, O oh, oh Lord my God, are your merciful works which you have done. And your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. God's done so many things, there's no possible way that you can or I can recount them in order, especially in order to God. You know, it, it's such a great work that he's done for us. There's so many things that he's done for us, so many different ways that he's blessed us. We couldn't put them in order. We can't even really number them, let alone put them in order. You know, John, at the end of his book, said he wrote this the things that he did write down were so that you would believe, but it would have been impossible to write everything down that Jesus did in that lifetime, that three and a half years that John knew him. It would have been impossible to write everything down. There weren't enough volumes, enough books to be able to hold everything that Jesus did. That's pretty amazing. People think that we have too much now. <laughs> the Bible's too big. The Bible's too long. It's too, I can't, you know, I just can't. I can't follow it. I can't. Can you imagine if we had all the volumes like John had said, everything that Jesus did, how thick, how many books would we have? You know, it, it's so it, God's God's work and his what he's done for us. It, it's impossible to to count it, but it's also impossible to recount it in order because of that. It says if I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Burn offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I shall, or then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. And so sacrifice and offering you did not desire. The, the law... The law, especially the Levitical law, covers all of the sacrifices that were required. And yet David would say, it, it, it's, that's not what you desire. 
That's not what God's great desire was for us to sacrifice. In other words, to become religious in it, the sacrificial religion or religiosity of it. it even, I mean, right out of the box with Samuel and, and Saul, the first king. Samuel has to tell Saul, to obey is better than the sacrifice. If you, you, it would have been more important for him to obey God and obey the word that Saul or Samuel had given him to wait until he came to make the sacrifice than to go ahead and do it before he got there or to go ahead and slaughter everything that he told him to slaughter and, and not come up with the, with the idea that he could hold back the best as a sacrifice to God. God didn't want it. And Isaiah is going to tell Israel in the beginning of Isaiah that their feast days and, and their rituals and their, their sacrifices, they're all yours and I, they're not even mine anymore. You know, you've made them yours. You've made, you've added things, you've taken away. You've just made them a religious check mark on your list. And that's all it was. And there was no more relationship built into the, or, or brought in to the sacrifice time. And, and God says here, the sacrifices and offering, David says, you don't desire. It's not what you want. You know, we <laughs> now think that our sacrifices are maybe, you know, 15 minutes in the morning to be, to, to read a devotional or read, you know, a couple chapters of the Bible. And we mark that off as a check mark in our on our list. I, I did that for today. I did this for today. I, you know, and we just go down the list and, and that's not really a sacrifice. That, that there's no relationship in that. It's just marking it off. I got it in. And at least I got it in, you know, um, <coughs> excuse me. And if you miss a day, oh my goodness, I got to go back and I got to read this day again and, and catch up and, all it is is just it becomes religion and it's not it's not a true sacrifice anymore it's nothing that brings you closer to god it's just something you check off the list you know our prayer time can be the same way we you know i have to pray from 7 in the morning to 7:15 in the morning and you set the alarm so you know that you're done and you <laughs> it's just you got the list that you got in front of you and you know it's it's just religious ritual at that point. It's not you're doing something good religiously, like it's a, a part of your life. It's just it's a must do right now at this time, at, on this day. You know, you know what I'm talking about. He says, "My ears you have opened," and literally means to be to to dig, and it's actually a reference to a bond slave. This, this goes back to Exodus. 21 5 through 6 where it describes what it happens when you become a slave for whatever reason you're you enter into slavery or you enter into servanthood uh, to a master because basically because you owed a price you owed a debt you couldn't pay so your life was his for however many years and it was de determined and agreed upon when when the debt was paid you were free to go but if during that time you've taken a wife you've had kids or you you know, whatever you just you just like the person who is your master, and so you decide, I want to stay. This life is way better than I had it. That's what got me in trouble be to begin with. And this guy is good. It's a person. This master is good, and I I would rather be here. And you go to him and say, I don't want to leave. So they take you to the doorpost of the, of the home. They drive the all through your ear. They put a uh, earring in there in your, in your ear and you're his now your life is his forever and David is saying here you you don't desire an offering or sacrifice but I've made myself a bond slave to you I'm I'm yours permanently it says burn offering and sin offering you did not require Th this means I don't know that David had a full because this is leading into the next couple of verses being very messianic. I don't know that David had a full understanding of what he was saying right here. When he says burn offering and sin offering, you did not require it. Except for that, if this came after the Bathsheba and Uriah incident, 
both capital offenses, there's no offering for those. For adultery and murder, there was no sin offering for that. Those were, you were put to death. That was capital offense. And yet David has experienced the grace of God in that. And so he's describing that. We know this because this is all we've known is the grace of God. We've not known making sacrifices, taking lambs to a temple and, you know, making sure it's the right day and the right kind of animal. And we, we don't know that. We know about it. But that has nothing to do with us being saved. You didn't, you didn't likely get saved because somebody was reading about the, the Levitical sacrifices and just reading about them. Now, maybe if somebody was reading about them and describing them and, and then explaining how Christ fulfilled those sacrifices and what he did, then, yeah, you could get saved from that. But if you were just reading through Leviticus, and that's the first book you pulled out, it's not likely you even understand what's going on. You know, Why? But David is describing, I, I believe here, just the grace of God. It's not about the sacrifices we make. We can never make a sacrifice that removes our sin. We can be obedient to God. And in the old covenant, they had to be obedient to God. But they went to restore a relationship with God, not just to be right to the people. And I think that was part of the problem. You went to do these sacrifices to be right before the people or right before the priest instead of right with God. I mean, because there were, there were, um, I, I don't have the right word for it. I want to say fellow, like peace offerings and that kind of thing where you went and it didn't have anything to do with sin. You took an offering to the, to the tabernacle or the temple and then you stayed there and you ate it. And you, and you ate with the priests and the, and the Levites and you, you participated in consuming that sacrifice and it was symbolic of you having that relationship with God. You just brought it to be with God. You know, and, and you had to eat it in so many days. I think it was three days. It had to be completely consumed or it had to be burned up after that. Um, but you know the the sin offering and the and the, we don't we don't really know anything of that except for what Jesus did for us on the cross. That's really the only offering we know. It's the only one that's affected our life, and there's nothing else we can bring. We offer ourselves as bond slaves. We offer ourselves as a living sacrifice because Christ told us to be a living sacrifice, or Paul told us to, and to give our life to Him in service, and, and it's the same thing as being a bond servant. And, and that's our sacrifice, to serve him the rest of our life, waiting for the day when our master calls us home. Waiting for the day to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And then there's a, he gets kind of, a, as he's caught up in this, as he's declaring the goodness of God and, and worshiping God in verses 4 and 5 and expounding that, it wasn't because of sacrifice. I entered into this relationship with you. You let me come in. I asked. You brought me in. It wasn't about the surf or about the sacrifices. And then it's like he gets a glimpse of the Messiah. He says, "Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God, and your law is within my heart." Right. This is in in Hebrews when we went through Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews quoted from this, that passage right there. You know, it, it, this is Jesus speaking through David with, with a, uh, a glimpse into a time when it was going to be all about grace and there will be no sacrifices except for him. And he says, behold, in the volume or in the scroll of the book, it is written of me. In, in all of Scripture, and especially, I shouldn't just say especially because it sounds like I'm separating the Old Testament from the New Testament, but the Old Testament is Jesus Christ revealed. It is pointing to the Messiah, to the time when he was going to come. It, it all is written of him from beginning to end. This book that we are able to hold in our hands or set in our laps or whatever, it is. It reveals Jesus from beginning to end. Our Messiah, our Savior. 
says, I delight to do your will, O oh my God, and your law is written in my heart. It's what keeps us on a, on a straight path, isn't it? To have the law of God written in our heart. And people say, well, you don't need the law. We're not saved by the law. I know we're not saved by the law. And yet, because I'm saved, I want to walk in that. It protects me. I can see the protection of the law. Part of our problem with, with our traffic in, in any given area is because we don't see the protection in the law that's written on a sign for us. When the law says this is the speed limit, that's the law, and it's posted right there on the sign. We don't see protection in that speed limit. We see it as something to break. We see it as ridiculous. We become rebellious. We we know they're not going to pull you over for five miles over. We're gonna, you know, we know it all, right? If it says. 55, we're going 60 at least, if not more. And if we know the flow of traffic and the flow of traffic, you got guys passing you going 75, 85, 95 miles an hour, you know you can hit 65 and they're not going to do anything to you. It was, we become rebellious when we see the signs. And, you know, worst thing in the world could happen is you come up on a construction zone and it says you got to slow down to 60. 45 of people are, are working there. It was the thought in your head. Tell them to stay out of my way. They know where the lines are too, right? Uh, what, 45. You know, we, we have it. We, we know. We become rebellious when we see the law. David is acknowledging that God's law brings protection. It's not about being saved. It's because he's entered into this relationship as a bond servant that the the restrictions and the things that God has put on David are for his safety, for his protection. Not, not to keep him down and enslave him or put him in chains. A, a bond slave didn't operate that way. A bond slave had actually quite a lot of freedom and the ability to go and to do business for the master. And it's to the point that David said, I, I delight to do your will. I delight to do your will. Do we delight to do God's will? Is it a thrill to us? Is it a thrill to us to share the gospel with somebody? Is it a thrill to us to live a life so that people notice there's a difference between us and them? If we get singled out because of it, is it a thrill? You know, I, I think I've told the story before, but one Sunday when we were still in Kalamazoo, Roger called me into the office and he said, you got to hear this. And he played a recording that was left on the church re phone, uh, a phone message, and it was tearing him apart. And I'm going to get you and, and you guys are, you know, just how horrible we were. And he's like, I don't know who that is, and I don't know why they're doing it. Neither one of us recognized the voice. But we both laughed, and his wife happened to be in there. She's like, what is wrong with you two? Like, hey, whatever we did, you know, evidently we don't know what we did. And maybe we did something bad, or maybe Roger did something wrong. I don't know, but we don't know who it is or why. It's kind of like getting a stone chucked at you because you're following the Lord. Maybe, you know, I don't know. We, could, we didn't even bother to sit and guess what, what he may have done or what we collectively may have done. It. We, just, we just laughed about it. It is kind of a thrill to get singled out, even if it's not, you know, necessarily in a good way. You know, if somebody's trying to say, in fact, the Bible teaches that, doesn't it? They, they say evil against you, but it's not. You know, I don't know. Maybe we're just a little twisted. But, you know, it, it's, I want to do God's will no matter what anybody else thinks. And I don't think that's really what David's, you know, my story may not really count here, but your law is within my heart. David, David loved the law of God. And listen, as king, he was required to write it out. 
you know, when he first comes into power, he, that's one of his requirements was for the king. Part of the law was the king had to write it all out. So it was stuck in his head and stuck in his heart. He didn't have any excuse for breaking a law. He couldn't, he couldn't say, I don't know what God's will is. If it was plain and clear, he knew what God's will was. You know, you see them ask, do I go to war or don't, or do I not go to war? You know, do I fight the Philistines today or do I, do I not? Do I hold back? Those are the kind of things they ask God. But is it okay to take my neighbor's wife? He didn't have to ask that. Is it okay to have, you know, to cover it up and have her husband? He didn't have to ask that. He knew. Verse 9 says, I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips. O Lord, for, O Lord, you yourself know, I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. He said, Lord, you know. I talk about you all the time. When I'm in front of the people, I talk about you. I tell them about your righteousness, so he's explaining the law. This is what God expects of us. And I've declared your faithfulness. He's recounted the faithfulness of God. All the stories that they would have had from beforehand, from the judges, from Moses and Joshua, all the ways that God had provided and set this nation up, David could, could tell those. And he could declare those in your salvation. And he still puts it as God's salvation. Your salvation, not mine. That, that some, I mean, it's very easy to forget. Because we ask, each, ask people, or you ask me, or people ask, are you saved? Yeah, I'm saved. I am. But it's not my salvation. It's God's salvation. He's given it to me. He saved me. There's nothing I can do to own that except receive it. He saved me. It's his work, not mine. It's his rescue operation, not mine. And David said, I just, I haven't stopped talking about it. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. When they come together as an assembly, when he addresses them, the, the nation as the king, he talks of God. He talks of the deliverance of God, whether it's in the moment after a battle or whether it's a time of maybe a, a time of celebration or a time of, of, of a feast day or something where David might stand up and say, hey, remember, this is what God did for us. Remember, we're a nation because God moved, because God said, Need more of that back in our nation, don't we? It'd be awesome if we had some leaders that would stand up like this and begin to speak of the things that God has done, rather than all the atrocities that men have done in this nation. I mean, you would think we should just, you know, get back on the boats and go back to England the way everybody talks because we're so bad. And it's just, <coughs> I'm sorry, get off my my soapbox before I get back on it. But seriously, it wouldn't be awesome if we had world leaders, if we or had national leaders or state leaders that would that would say these things publicly without fear of, oh, you've offended me. Who do you think you are talking about your God and your Jesus and your Messiah? Who do you think you are? I'm his. I don't have any not only do I not have a choice, not only am I, am I commissioned to tell you about him, but I don't want to not tell you about him. I want you to know about him. I want you to know about him because he saved me. He could save you. Who are you to tell me I need to be saved? Well, I'm the guy that knows the way, the truth, and the life. You know? That's why I need to tell you. I need to tell you because, hey, you know, when we get into the whole thing to say it without fear to say it because it's a good thing 
and it's good for people to know, to talk to our kids about it and our grandkids about it, about the things that God has done. Mm -hmm. To give him honor and glory for everything, even the things that we seem like maybe they're too little to mention or attach God to. Just attach it to him anyways. You, know, you go on a vacation, you have a good time, be thankful to the Lord for it. You know? Verse 11, do not withhold your tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let your loving kindness and your truth continually preserve me. For innumerable evils have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of my head. Therefore, my heart fails me. Wow, what a swing. From you have preserved me and you have pulled me out of the miry clay. You have saved me to a messianic um, understanding in, in some verses of what was to come, of the grace of God and all that he's done and bless the Lord and and. And you're, you know, I tell everybody about you to, to, Lord, don't hold your mercies away from me. You know, don't withhold that from me. Keep it coming. To now, he's already entering into another trouble. Another time of trouble. And he can see it coming. Let your loving kindness and your truth continually preserve me. I already know. I've come out of one, and I came out of one because you pulled me out. And I've had this time to worship, and Lord, I am so thankful for that, but I can see the next one coming already. And already it's here, and already my enemies have surrounded me, and it's, you know, the things that are going to overtake me or have my iniquities. And look at it, it's not even just the people, or it's the evils. It's his own iniquities have overtaken him. So that I am not able to look up. I'm ashamed. At one point, he's, I'm your servant. You're my God. I know your grace. I know your mercy too. But I also know me. And I know what's in here. And these things are already coming back on me. And I can't even look up. I have to stay in this position of, of submission to you. So they are more than the hairs of my head. Therefore, my heart fails me. What did we talk about on, on Sunday? That, uh, so not this past week, but the week before. What comes out of a man is what defiles a man. David knows his own heart. He knows his own propensity for, for sin. He knows what's in here has still got to be dealt with. Even though he has the grace of God, the wicked and the evil is still there and can come out at any time. And to keep that down, he's going to need the help of God. So be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be ashamed and brought to mutual confusion who seek to destroy my life. You see, there are other people who know David's weaknesses. And, and they would willingly destroy him. There are other people who, who just know, just want to take him out. And would destroy him. He's, I need your help. You know, I, I need to be, uh, I let them be ashamed. Don't let me be ashamed. Let me handle these situations correctly. Let them be driven backward and brought to dishonor who wish me evil. Let them be confound, confounded because of their shame who say to me, aha, aha, like they've caught him. Like they've got something on him. Let them be brought to shame. Basically, what he's saying is, Lord, I don't want to defend myself. You defend me. That has been one of the one of the greatest lessons I've learned being in Calvary Chapel. The first pastor's conference I went to, I heard Pastor Chuck talk about this. And, and one of the comments, because somebody said, when do you know it's the right time to defend yourself? And he just said, I find that if I feel the need to defend myself, that God will let me. So, but I usually choose to let God defend me. I don't usually defend myself. And I've, I've seen 
people who were coming after the pastors who had learned it from Chuck, and it just frustrates their the people who would take them down and just makes them foam at the mouth sometimes. I mean, it's just, it makes them crazy. And it, it's a lesson that, that I'm sure Pastor Chuck learned from, maybe even from this passage of Scripture. I don't know, but he just, let God defend you. Let him defend you. Speak of the good things of God and let God defend you. Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let such as love your salvation say continually, The Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me. You have helped my or you are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. And what a what a great way. I mean, he doesn't spend a lot of time in that self pity. He just says, Lord, you have to help me. You know, save me from myself and save me from my enemies. And then let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Lord, bless those who seek you. Just bless them. If they're seeking you, Lord, just bless them, man. Let them know you're there. Let such as love your salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. Now remember, this is being read to the masses. This is the encouragement. It's, it's read publicly. At, at worship times or whenever they would read such a, a psalm and, and David this is an encouragement from David to them from God to them and this is what you do you know but such as love your salvation say continually the Lord be magnified but I am poor and needy yet the Lord thinks upon me I'm poor and needy David's the king of the nation he he has access to wealth and he says I'm poor and needy and yet the Lord thinks upon me the Lord thinks about me Isn't that, you think about all that, that he does all that he keeps moving I mean the universe moves and spins and goes in all kinds of directions and and while he's controlling all of that, he thinks about you. You're on his mind. He's not so busy over here making sure that planets don't collide that he can forget you. He's not so involved in what's going on on the other side of the world in the middle of a war that he can forget about you. He never forgets us. We're never out of his mind. Not from before the beginning of the world, before the foundations of the world. God knew you. He knew me. The lamb who was slain from the foundations of the world had you, had me on his mind when he said, let there be light. You know, it wasn't just Adam and Eve. He wasn't just making it up as he went. All of this happened for a reason. Everything is a, had purpose to it. The way creation happened. He, 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 you know, it wasn't, again, he wasn't just making it up as he went. He, he spoke purposefully the words that he spoke. And things happened the way that they happened. On purpose. All designed for one day to do something for you, for me. He looked past Adam and Eve to us. He, he is all-knowing God. And he's never forgotten us. And that's the, the motto I kept promoting when we first started this. I just, I just asked God because, you know, Kalamazoo had God give second chances and everything is second chances and and and, and it's good. I don't want to, I just didn't want it to be ours. I want, Lord, give me something, something to, to do to, so people, something for people to hang on to. And it has always been, God has not forgotten you. You have always been on his mind. 
and it doesn't matter where you're at. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that you're not the president. It doesn't matter that you don't hold a high position or that you do. Compared to him, everybody is poor and needy. And when we should we should remember that he thinks about us all the time. He loves us that much. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, oh my God. I know you're the one that's pulling me out. You're the one that pulled me out in the past. You're the one that will pull me out in the future. It just don't delay. Don't let it last long. Come quickly. Come quickly. Isn't that what we say? That's how John ended Revelation. That's how our Bible ends. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Don't delay. Tried to explain that to my son again a couple days ago. I know there's things you want to do. I was 18. I know there were things. There were things when I was 18 that I wanted to do that I kind of hoped, you know, Jesus would just hold back long enough for those to happen, and then He could come, and I'd be happy. And I said, you know, there's still things I want to do, but I know this: I'm not going to be disappointed if I don't get to finish off the bucket list or whatever you want to call it again. If He calls me out, and if He calls you out. Dude, if he, if he blows the trumpet before I'm done talking, you're not going to be disappointed. And I told him, it's weird. I get it. It's weird to want to go and to want to stay at the same time. It's weird, but it's okay. You're ready to go. Now just serve him with all your heart the rest of your days. Just, just, just do that. You know, he was going through a bad day. And I'm like, just, this is... This is where we go. This is how we get through. All right, next one. I think we can we can get through this one too. Psalm forty one. Again, to the chief musician, which means that it's a, a public psalm, a psalm of David. Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he will be blessed on the earth. You will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness. You will sustain him on his sickbed. Right, so, blessed is he who considers the poor. Now we're going to move into some kind of personal responsibility. right? To, to consider the poor, to consider those who are in trouble who have need and we we go to them and we we uh, we care for them the Lord will deliver him in the time of his trouble is basically what he's saying if you if your heart is to help those who are in a time of trouble the Lord you you only do that because you know the Lord helps you in your time of trouble you're taking the, the love and the care that God has given you and you're, you're letting him now use you to deliver that to somebody else. And you can do it because you know, right? You know, the, he'll be blessed on the earth. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive. You will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him on his, on his bed of illness. You will sustain him on his sickbed. The Lord's going to care for you till your last breath. If you if your heart is to serve Him, and we've seen people do it to their last breath on their sickbed, still trying to share with other people who they see as less fortunate because they don't know Jesus, or, or how many people have we seen on their sickbed who know they're going home? And everybody around them is hurting. And yet they try to comfort the ones who are there supposedly to comfort them. Verse 4 says, I said, Lord, be merciful to me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. My enemies speak evil of me. When will he die and his name perish? 
If he comes to see me, he speaks lies, his heart gathers iniquity to itself. When he goes out, he tells it. Lord, you got to be merciful to me. Right? Heal my soul. For I've sinned against you. So David's acknowledging his sin against God. And his sin has caused the rest of this. My enemy speaks evil of me. And this is what the enemy says. When, when will he die and his name perish? This enemy is, is vicious toward David. So if he comes to see me, he, speak, he speaks lies. So I can't trust what he's going to say to me. Um, his heart gathers iniquity to itself. And he, he, when he goes out, he tells it. And so he's making things up. Or he's exposing every little thing that I do. He's doing everything he can to take me down. And maybe, maybe he's speaking of Absalom. I don't know. It's possible, but his own son is not the only enemy David had. So, you know. Verse 7, all who hate me whisper together against me. Against me they devise my hurt. An evil disease, they say, clings to him. And now that he lies down, he will rise up no more. Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Everybody's betraying him. David knows betrayal. And, and he's, he understands that this has come about because of his own iniquity, but he knows betrayal and it hurts. And he's alone because of it. He doesn't know who to trust. Verse 10, but you, O Lord, be merciful to me and raise me up that I may repay them. A little vengeance in David's heart, huh? By this I know that you are well pleased with me because my enemy does not triumph over me. As for me, uh, you uphold me in my integrity and set me before your face forever. Now, if this has come about by because of David's iniquity, or maybe David's just acknowledging that he is a sinner. He knows he's a sinner. But even then, he knows that because of the grace of God, as far as God is concerned, his integrity has been made new too. And as long as he walks in that, whether anybody else believes it or not, doesn't matter. It's between him and God. And he can say, you know, as for me, you uphold my, you uphold me in my integrity. You hold me up. Everybody else thinks I've lost. Everybody else thinks I'm the loser. Everybody knows what I did wrong. And they know the old me. They don't know the new me. And they still see me as weak. They still see me as evil. But you won't let my enemy triumph over me. We have an enemy. We have an enemy because we belong to God. We have, we have Satan and his, and the demons. We have spiritual enemies, and they love our past, and they love to remind us of our past and try to tear us down and break us down, even on the inside because of it. Right? They, it comes back regularly. Never mind. And and even without them, we relive our past all on our own over and over and over again. Man, if I could go back to this situation 20 years ago and say this, things would have been different. I can't believe I did this. I, you know, and we're like, I just want to get, let me go back. Let me, just let me go back and fix that. You know? and, and if we've already dealt with it with the Lord, he's ta he, his response is really kind of like, well, what are you talking about? Well, when I, when I blew it here, I don't know what you're talking about. Because he's forgiven us. He's removed our sin as far as the east is from the west and remembers it no more. He chose to remember it no more, to not hold it against us, even though everybody else still does. Even though we still do. He's chosen not to. And David can say, listen, Lord, you uphold me in my integrity. I'm, I'm trying to walk before you, whether everybody else can see it or not, or nobody else can see it or not. I'm trying to walk with integrity before you. 
Put me before your face forever. He doesn't want God to just be a part of his life right now. He's depending on a forever relationship with God. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. And it's just a short little cry out to the Lord. This is what the enemy says. But Lord, you preserve me. You're the one that keeps me. I know that. And and no big long praise thing at the end. One, just a couple lines, right? Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. That says a lot. We could say blessed be the Lord God of Israel of Calvary Chapel. Blessed be the Lord God of the United States. Doesn't matter if everybody else is is acknowledging it or not. He's blessed to be the Lord God of the universe. From everlasting to everlasting. From eternity past before let there be light to eternity future when there's a new heaven and a new earth and there's no more no more time. Blessed be the Lord God, because he's the only one, the only one who spans all of that. It really, if you think about it, you're thinking about just how big God is. You're trying to think about something you can't even imagine. It, it's really easy to just throw those words out and say, wow, that's amazing. Like, what a, what a, 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 just a short little shot of praise. But if you dwell on it and think about it, it should cause you to be amazed at the God you serve. It should cause us to be in awe of him. It's not just a, a quick little blurb. And, and it may be a short psalm and it may be a short a short you know couple of lines of, of worship but there's huge meaning in it let's not forget you know we saw that we just talked about it anyways God has not forgotten you don't forget God don't forget him don't forget who you worship who you belong to, who you're a bondservant to. Jesus asked us at, at that last supper in the, that last Passover, as often as you do these things, do them and remember me. Don't forget me. I won't forget you. Don't forget me. Let's pray. Father, thank you. It's just, there are not big enough words to to express our our amazement of you. I don't even know what to say. We love you, we thank you, we praise you. You're the God of Israel. You're the God of the universe from everlasting to everlasting. And you think about us, each one of us. No, we don't deserve it. But we'll receive it. And Lord, we pray that you would come quickly. In Jesus' name, amen.